was Harvard Business School, I did that for two years. And at Harvard Business School, I really liked entrepreneurship. I took all the courses that they had the second year in entrepreneurship. And then I really wanted to join a startup. Um, and I joined a, a 30 person startup. It was sort of an A round. They raised maybe a million dollars. It was a software company doing speech recognition. Uh, and I stayed with that through about one round of financing before it went sideways. And then I found myself out on the streets and went uh, over the years and found technology to media lab on the electronic paper. And so I started a company uh, with some guys over there from scratch. And that was years. And it, it was um, paper like display screens for electronic books and readers like the Kindle and the Nook and the. Uh, and the uh, other kinds of electronic reader devices for about 20 on the market. So, um, you guys sold the screens now? We sold, we sold 50 million of those screens. So, the whole cycle from startup or the raw lab technology through to shipping your first 10,000 units and then your first million and then, you know, millions of units a month. Um, and I run rate about $20 million a year. So, it was a uh, the whole cycle. We sold the company in 2009, uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's my life. We traveled around the world. We traveled around the world for a while, so I uh, got back a couple of months ago and uh, came back to look at the next great thing to do. So, and, and I'll, I'll give a quick plug that um, I ran a book called Founder Dialogue, and Russ was my guest 10 days ago, uh, telling the story to me and diving pretty deep into it. So we probably won't go deep on that today, but if you're interested in that, we actually see the blog and the video. Did you get the video for approval yet? Yeah. Okay, so it's not up yet, um, but it should be up shortly. Uh, and you can find it at Cyber Dialogue. Cyber Dialogue dot com for stuff. I don't know if anyone's in in the deeper story, and that video will go online by next week. Um, my quick bio and background, I'm a few time entrepreneur. I uh, started a company with Slides Consultants for a year. Um, I'm actually very negative on consulting. People, uh, some of you might have been, I ran a, I ran a skill fair course on um, why consulting is a bad career choice for aspiring entrepreneurs. Uh, Russ and I don't totally agree on that, so that can be an interesting conversation. And then, um, then I started something called Aspect Ads New York, which is a web development company in 99, web marketing development. Uh, I came to the in 2001. Uh, I was here through 2003, taking also every entrepreneurship course I possibly could. Um, I was very convinced I wanted to start a company. Uh, I graduated and started a company that also was a spin out of MIT called Bronxist Technologies. We ran a business plan competitions here and over at MIT and uh, did pretty well in both, which was fun. And then I uh, started a company in 03, was funded in 04 by a bunch of venture capital, venture capital firms in town. Um, and, uh, and built a technology that does 3D scanning of the mouse to enable mouse customization and production of dental products. So, pronounced bridges, implants, orthodontics, or all that stuff can, instead of being created by artisans by hand, can actually be created by computers and machines um, in an automated fashion in a much more accurate outcome because you're able to scan the mouse. 2006, um, 3M bought our company. Uh, and turned it into a product that maybe some of you have seen, not the price, not as many as I'd like, um, called the Lava Care Side Oil Scanner, uh, Lava COS. And um, in 2008, I left, at the end of 2000, beginning of 2009, I left. I'm um, free to start a fund called Founder Collective, which has become one of the most active seed funds in the country. Uh, we've invested in over 100 companies. It's a three year old fund, a uh, $50 million fund with uh, two partners here in Boston. Uh, we're the full-time partners in the fund. I'm one of the two, um, two in New York and three in California. So, why don't we spend a couple minutes, maybe the rest will start, talking about how you thought about a career in well, you were an MBA. How did you think about a career in entrepreneurship? Did you worry about risk? How did you trade off all that stuff? Um, how did you approach it? And I think you have seen for a little bit, and then, you know, for 10 minutes, we really just open up some stuff. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think it, it, when I was in the, you know, when you're in business school, in some ways, it's like two years of long job search. You spend your two years sort of thinking, what will the next big thing be? What will my career, how will it change as a result of business school? So you give it a lot of thought. Um, 
I was really interested in maybe what's different about managing a 50-person company or a 30-person company versus managing a big organization. So I was pretty convinced that you need to get some experience at a smaller company in order to be able to start your own. I really want to start my own company. So between my first and second year, I found a little local business, uh, which was a software reseller, and I helped them set up a store on, on the web, uh, which was, I think, really only the second story I ever did set on the web, which dates me as 1994, uh, 93. So, um, the... How did you have to do that? I was really the web was really new. Like most of the patent things I know yet. Yeah. You know, when when we were there and um, I was interested in this one company in Sudbury, Massachusetts that had a million dollars of online sales, which is by far the most of anybody. And it turned out it was this one guy who was selling modems online. And like, talk about your classic positioning. Everybody who was online you knew the faster modem. And then like you remember the twelve hundred baud and then the ninety six and the next one maybe. Remember the twelve hundred baud and the ninety six hundred baud? Yeah. So everybody wanted this. And he would what he would do was like so fast. I know, it was really fast. So it was thirty two thousand, so each new wave he did a whole new wave of stuff. And people used to have these computer magazines like PC magazines. He would go to everybody who wanted to sell something. And he would basically say, why don't you give me a hundred bucks this month and I'll list you in my ad. So he would sort of run these omnibus ads with a hundred different products in them and each guy basically paid for his ad. It would drive traffic to his website. And at that time, the World Wide Web didn't really exist. Like, no one had seen it when I started this summer job. And then in the middle of the summer, it started to appear. Like, we were building a store for Gopher, which is a pure anyway. So the second thing started here, and he said, we've got to change this and add a World Wide Web. So we, we did that um, and, and helped him. There really is a big difference running his company with like 20 people. So it really is different to run a 20 person company than say 20,000 companies, large companies. So I, I wanted to have that experience. So I think, getting back to your question, how do you get from MBA into, into a startup? I think it's really, I saw three paths. Um, which is how you, how you think of it. I always think of three paths. One is you go work for a name brand company like Microsoft or Intuit or, you know, Paradigm or one of these big guys. You spend four or five years there as a product manager. You get to understand a certain class of customer and what's their problem. You get to understand a certain set of technologies and you learn and you imprint like a little baby bird. You imprint on how does the business model work in this industry so that this big company makes money. Having that recipe for success in your brain, you then break off, you go to the VC and say, I'm the hot guy from this big company that everybody knows, and they back you because they know you know the recipe for success, and you can start your own business. So that's sort of delaying the startup for four or five years so you set your ticket punch as a good company with a great brand. That's method A. Method C was the complete opposite, which is just come up with some idea and jump in. I didn't have a good idea, and I didn't have the right co-founders, and you know, so I wasn't going to just jump in, and I didn't have any experience. You know, I'd been a consultant, so I didn't have any management, so I couldn't do it. So option B is, all right, I know I'm not ready to do my own startup, but I think there's something different about running a startup versus a big company. I want to get right into that. So I will go work at someone else's startup. And I think you guys have some sort of job fair coming up soon. You know, there's a lot of startups pitching. That was what I tried to do. And, and the way I got into that was to be a product manager. Again, the product manager, I think, is a great general management type of role because you see on the one side what your engineering team can do, and on the other side, what does the market want? So you define product, you basically are the mini CEO of that product. Um, so that's how I got in and started in, in that middle course. So I, I guess for me, um, I pretty much thought I wanted to start another company. Uh, and I think part of the reason I did just was I felt like I had no idea what I was doing starting my first company. And I thought if I could take this, I'd learn a lot more about what I should be doing running the company. And, and I, I also think that was pretty true. I think there's been a big um, sort of backlash. I think one's from anti MBA for entrepreneurs. But actually, I, I think the MBA, especially, I think the mistake is most MBAs are not 
just for say, training or for building skills to be entrepreneurs. Most of them are probably going to find us or consulting. And so people look at them and they're like, you're not an entrepreneur. And the A's are not entrepreneurs. Right? And there's some minority of MBAs. And luckily, it's been great to see it growing. When I came in 2001, it was right after the dot-com bus. Nobody took it to see entrepreneurship anymore. Um, but, but I think the people who come to the school looking for that really do that. It's kind of as the program at this time, right? And, um, I, I certainly did. I think Russ did too. Like some of the conversations we had, and spending time in like Tom Eisen and Noam Hoffman and like um, Bill Salmon and Bill Lasker's classes, like those, like they were formative for me in a whole lot of ways, right? And so it's pretty clear when you start something, but the first week of school, I, bumped, I met Michael Rosenblum, who became my partner at Bronco, um, co founder, and, and he's also a partner of our fund. Um, I met him the first week of school, actually, our girlfriend, you know, Wise, introduced us. And I remember Mike asked me, or I asked him, I don't remember, but the, the lore of the story that we both two remember is one of us asked the other, you know, would you start another company? Mike had also started one before business school. And I said, definitely, but only as the stars are one. But like, I didn't want to force, I'm going to start a company. Like, I wanted to have something I was passionate and excited about to start if I was going to start a company with people I wanted to build a company with. Because um, my first company would still exist. I, I never quite had that sort of set up by purposely, like that, I, not just purpose, but that I was really, um, that I loved in many ways about how we, you know, different aspects, particularly in the business. I was in a complicated business, we never thought of, I found that to be like a, a much less rewarding kind of business to be in for a bunch of reasons. So, um, so, you know, obviously, ironically, the stars align with my good building branches, but so it was definitely on my mind. I definitely want to start a company here. I was taking entrepreneurship courses. I also did talk to different companies that I might want to join that were generally more startups than anything else. Um, I spent a summer working for an entrepreneur in town uh, that I got introduced to. I networked in the community. He was literally starting a new business. Um, he started the day I became available that summer, which probably should have been a sign that, you know, sort of why did he wait for me? Maybe that was a little strange in some ways. Um, and I think that was always a challenge for that company. It, just, it wasn't as aggressive as I would have liked it to be. Um, but uh, that was a great experience. And Ross Interactive funded half of my salary for that summer. Um, and he paid half my salary for that summer, which was, which was awesome. Um, I didn't make much, but I didn't care. I made enough. And I was doing some really interesting stuff. And helped me sort of formulate my opinion that it increased my confidence. Um, but also helped me formulate my opinion about how I thought about starting companies. And then Mike and I had some idea at the end of our, sec- our first year that we were looking at and thinking about. And um, at the beginning of the second year, we were more excited about that same idea. We we're starting to do some work. We went to the MIT based plan, Mr. Um, to find some engineers that could help us think about whether the idea was viable uh, technologically. And uh, we met Professor Doug Hart. We didn't know the professor, but we met Professor Doug Hart. He listened to our concept he said, and he said, yeah, I think that would work. Um, and then he said, but what I'm doing is much more interesting. Um, why don't we come see what I'm doing? And we went to his lab and saw what he was doing. And I don't think we understood what he was doing. I think we didn't show very much about what he was doing. Um, so it was all very uh, confusing. But I think we thought he was very compelling. And so we made our Joe Lasseter entrepreneurial marketing class project working with Doug Hart to look for market opportunities for this technology. And I remember saying to his Doug's team, Look, we're not starting a company. That's not what we're doing here. Um, we're working on an academic project. And if at the end of that, we all think we can start a company, we're going to talk about starting a company. But my, I was, you know, sort of um, cautious to, you know, force myself to start a company, right? Um, I wanted it to be something we were really excited about. And um, by the end of the second, by the end of the second year, we hadn't quite found our market yet. But there was a bunch of reasons I was really compelled about starting this business, and I passed up some job offers, and so did my dad, and we decided to start it. And we, uh, we hoped funding wasn't as far away. Actually, and uh, so it's a slightly funny story, I guess. In March of 2003, we, we presented this concept clinic at the MIT Enterprise Forum to a bunch of entrepreneurs, mostly service providers, but about our concept. And I remember somebody saying, um, I think you guys are about 15 months away from financing. I remember being so, like, it was a very negative time in sort of entrepreneurship at large. Like, money wasn't being raised. It was just a really bad time. He said, you're 15 months away. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, if you're 15 months away, I would never want to do this. Like, that's what he was talking about. About 15 months later, we were <laughs> 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 the company. 
um, after we, we looked at a lot of applications for the technology, and, and we really found one in a place that most people thought was pretty uninteresting as well. That on the surface, would never have been interesting to me. I would never have wanted to spend six years in dentistry um, as a market. But at a certain point, when you think you can change the market, the market becomes really, really interesting. Um, and we really felt we could change that market, and it became really interesting. And this was these things on the surface that just seemed really uninteresting, like chemistry was just not. A lot of people told us, like, that's just a dumb, you're dragging a company to a really stupid place. But the more we do the work, despite we were getting the decent thing, and like the people who actually really matter were the customers, right? You get a lot of false validations from the investors. Um, you get a lot of false validations from anyone. You've got to really parse what they're saying and why are they saying it, and is, are these functions they're using correct? And you hear them and you learn from them, but you try to, you, know, you, get, you get a lot of people taking data, and you've got to figure out what you believe. And um, by talking to the, the industry, we really came to believe that we were onto something. That, 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 I describe it as, you know, in, in B2B, when you're um, solving a problem uh, and you're talking to people in your industry about the problem you want to solve, and it makes you feel like you're curing cancer in their industry, you know you're onto something. I would imagine the sort of low power, um, higher contrast screens. There were a lot of people um, in different industries that looked at that and they were like, this will solve a really big problem for us. Like, this is a really big deal. I don't maybe not, but. We were, I mean, I, I would think so. I mean, you're, you're not. Yeah, no, it was a holy, it was one of these holy grail. It's always an interesting sign if you see people have made efforts to do what you want to do, but it failed. Like, you know, a partner's intuit was the 20th guy to have a checkbook balancing, right? There's, I've been other people who tried to build and, um, what's the name? Before Palm Pilot, there was the Newton, right? So, yeah. it wasn't that the idea was new, it was sort of the, the demand had been evidenced by earlier efforts that failed. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's sort of a good thing to know. There have been a lot of people trying to make novel displays, which we hadn't really succeeded. There were a couple of people with close technology who hadn't really succeeded, but it showed you that there was something there if we could get, get along with it. You know what I think what Russ is hitting on a little bit for me is, I call it the myth of the idea. You know, you're looking for a reason for being, and then it's a huge process to actually validate that and, and think about how you're going to overcome the challenges and really get deep and sophisticated about what you're going after. But there's this like myth that a business is about coming up with an idea. Like Russ is saying, look, people have the idea of better displays. That was not like a new idea. They had some really great insights on how to do it. But that was all about getting really sophisticated about, you know, what are the problems with displays and how do you overcome those problems and how do we build that and how do we make that work at scale and I think for us, you know, I was at a conference with 150 opinion leaders in dentistry, which um, not the opinion leaders that I most thought I spent my life spending time with. But I was at this conference really with like the best people from all over the world in this industry. And somebody, we just gave you the product, and somebody raised their hand in the audience and said, Eric, this is amazing. How did you come up with this idea? And I said, I want to introduce you to somebody. In the front row right here is a man named Francois Duray. In 1973, Francois Duray wrote his PhD thesis. I'm standing the mouth on how that would change dentistry. Now, I'm not going to say how old I was in 1973, but I wasn't born then. Right? The whole crowd started laughing, but it was not a new idea, right? And it was just an idea that took, you know, 35 years for somebody to actually execute the market in a way that really works for this purpose. But it wasn't a new idea, right? It was just, you know, it, it was a matter of finding the exact space, right? I mean, you take a bunch of guys out of Harvard and out of MIT with some 3D scanning technology and 40 industries to think about, and all the biases people have about why dentistry is not a fun place to be, and actually putting that together and realizing that actually we need to put every dime and every resource we have into this, right? And getting sophisticated enough to understand that that was the right place to be, I think that was a big part of the entrepreneurial equation. And what product solves that problem? How do you build it? Especially in both of our cases, we built some very um, cutting edge technology. How do you get there? How do you get there? Cut the price. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Russia is $150 million. So and there's another question if it's not that cost effective, how do you capitalize that <laughs> and make that work? Um, so uh, th those were a lot of the parts of the entrepreneurial journey. We were chatting before about manufacturing and supply chain, and these all stuff nobody talks about. But if you do it wrong, it kills you. Um, but literally, if you put you out of business, um, and, uh, you know, we talked before also about, like, scale up and in inventory. I mean, that's a situation where 
you know, Motorola had them scale up to 10 million units a quarter, and then just canceled the entire year's worth of volume. Yeah, that was, that was, that was, a, that was a bad, bad moment. But you know, I'm, I'm listening to yeah. as, you're, as you're talking about it, and I, I love that uh, that you talked about with the myth of the perfect idea, and, um, it, and it just doesn't happen because if you knew everything you would need to know to be fully diligent on whether your idea was good or not, it would it'd be it's impossible because someone else would have already had to build it by having built that same business. So you can't know in advance uh, by definition whether your new business is going to succeed or not. And frankly, if you did know, you might run screaming to the hills and never actually get started. So being naive is kind of good, you know, because you're willing to get out there. And um, one of the analogies that I keep coming back to, I don't know why, just clicked with me, is, is has anybody ever changed the tire on a car? No, I haven't either. But, but I'm told that the way it works is, you know, you've got these five bolts and you screw them on with your hand, right? And like, this is a big warning. Don't over tighten any one bolt, right? Because then the thing gets on slightly tilted and then it cracks. And you're supposed to give a couple twists here, a couple twists here, a couple twists here, so you evenly get the tire on. And I think building companies are a lot like that. You can't go really deep in the technology or really deep in the supply chain or really deep in. You've got to kind of, kind of get them all in play in parallel. And so. You're going to have a general idea, like I'm going to scan the mouth for dentistry. Doesn't know, he doesn't know what the product is. He doesn't know how he's going to sell it. He doesn't know what the distribution channel is going to be. He doesn't know what his price point is going to be. He doesn't know the manufacturing. It doesn't matter. He starts a company, right? And he's going to, so he's got like one twist in the lug nut, a vague notion in all directions. As you put a hypothesis worth spending time on, right? What's your reason for being, right? Like, what's your, what, what, what is intriguing you enough to spend some time on something that, like, you think might actually be interesting? And then you can't actually get overly wed to it, right? Because it's going to change. Yeah, it does. It does definitely change. Um, so I, we can talk about so many different things. Like maybe one other topic that I, I, I just get this question. I'm, I'm in the IR here right now, and I'm doing every every other week. I come in and I do eight off-hour sessions for students, and, and most of them are MBAs. But I get undergrads and get a law student. Um, and uh, one question I get a lot of is like, how do you think about the risk? No one's talking about that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I was just saying, is that like something on people's minds? Like, how did you think about the risk of being there? I mean, you were making good salary as a consultant. You went and got an MBA. You racked up debt. Right. You're graduating, and you go to a startup. Uh, and then you start a company. Right? I think both have sort of different risk profiles. But so a lot of people yeah. are pretty risky. Um, so I was lucky. I was married. My wife was working. She had a steady salary. So we didn't have kids. It was a good time. Um, and we lived, we, we bought a house which was maybe half of what the bank would have loaned us. <laughs> so that if one of us lost our job, we would be okay. And it turned out really well because although I didn't end up leaving my job, I did have to take a fairly low salary at the beginning because everybody has to to kind of get it off the ground. And then a couple of years later, uh, maybe five years later, my wife decided she wanted to, to focus on family. We had two kids by that point, and we didn't have to worry that we had you know, over leveraged ourselves on our house. Yeah. Actually, one of the important things about risk is keep the size of your burn rate, your personal burn rate, keep it low. You know, by that six years into Ian, seven years into Ian, we spent $108 million we never shipped anything. We had this great asset. I could see, I could see that if I could just stick with it, it'd be great. Um, so even though we had to go through a recap and sign up for another bunch of years, uh, I, was, I was motivated to stay with it. There's no way I could have done that if we had raised our, you know, if, I, if this mortgage had been too big. I would have had to, to wash out of the startup days and go just get a job at a consulting firm or something. So being able to kind of keep your personal costs low and buy yourself time is important, not just for the business, but also for your own managing your own career. Yeah, I mean, I think the really big risk of startups is short-term tax flow. So the question is, in, in, across the startup career, whether you're doing startups or starting companies, the question becomes, what are your sets of obligations? So like your mortgage and family and all this stuff. Um, and how do you manage those, right? And I think if you can keep those pretty low or, you know, your pre kids that helps a lot. And um, your spouse works. In my case, also my, my spouse, my spouse had a federal government job, so she wasn't making a ton of money, but she was making something. Um, and we didn't have kids at the time, so that was super helpful. Um, I think that's 
that's a really big risk. Because I was on a panel recently with Gary Mueller in uh, Noel Moskvin's class um, about sort of his startups. And I thought he had this great comment he made, which is, I'd way rather have the risk of controlling my own state than have somebody in a you know, boardroom that I've never met, you know, maybe 500 miles away, um, deciding whether or not stuff I'm working on that I think is really important uh, is irrelevant to the company anymore. And, and also, the second set of things, you know, it's funny, LeBron says he never had a layoff since the freedom bought us. Right? So it's still risky for a startup. We still have 32 people before they bought us, never had a layoff. So seven people with them pushing us to hire faster, the economy gets bad, and, and we're like in the throes of selling and scaling, and they're like, peanut butter, we need a 15% cut. Forget about how your business is going. Figure out how to cut 15% of the people. And so, you know, what risks? I mean, you think like we were selling and people were telling us, you know, like, oh my God, now this is the perfect combination. So life is startup, it's really exciting, and you're in the market, but now you have all of that security of a um, $60 billion, $70 billion public company behind you, right? And yeah, it was true in a way, but, you know, there were people in St. Paul, Minnesota, making decisions that none of us had any control over. Um, that's a different kind of risk, but it's there, right? And, you know, we saw people at 3M who spent 20 years in the company get laid off, and they hadn't done anything to build their personal brands outside the company. Their brand was that they worked for 3M, and now 3M didn't want them. That's pretty hard to have to get a job from that. And all the people they'd ever worked with, I don't say ever, many people they have worked worked with were at 3M. Right? So you couldn't go to those people to get a job. And so I think one of the neat things about careers in startups is you do a good job in a startup and a lot of get exposure to all these people who come and go and do different things and three years later they're running something else and they know about you and they know about your skill set and they want you. And you start to build a brand that's not just um, you know, just the company you work for. Right, you start to build a brand of people you've interacted with who know you're capable and talented. And so, I, I, I don't think of the startup risk as sort of the idiosyncratic risk of a startup. But when we laid off those people, are actually a few years later when 3 m decided to move all operations to St. Paul and shut down what they was a 50 person site, none of those people had trouble finding jobs. So, you know, so like the people who were laid off in the same period of time since 3 m they had a lot of trouble finding jobs. They've been there for years at this big, great company. The people were at little tiny bunches technologies, which almost nobody's ever heard of. Um, none of them had trouble finding jobs because they were really talented engineers and they built up their name and they were part of a successful startup and a lot of their alumni had gone elsewhere to do cool things and they just sucked them in. They just grabbed them. They were like, oh, that guy's really talented. You gotta get him. But I moved people into a lot of the companies that we were investors in. Um, so I don't think it, it looks a little different, but, but the challenge is, you know, when you have that volatility, can you handle this work from cash flow use? Because one guy said to me, because I was having this conversation, he said, you know, my personal payroll has four people on it. I take care of both of my parents mm-hmm. um, and two siblings right now. And so I'm trying to figure out how to start helping. I was like, you know, maybe you can't. Maybe you can, but maybe you can't, right? Like, you have a certain set of obligations. You need to feel like you have very stable cash flow. Maybe that's just not realistic. You know, and I've had other people say to me, I'm totally good. I've got six months of money in the bank and I'm going to start a company. I'm like, think 12 to 18 months. Right? Why? Well, because if you have six months, you know, it takes like three months to get deep on any opportunity. Right? And then you might find in the course of that that you don't love the opportunity. It's not as good as you think. Now you've got to redo it and start again. Or even if you love the opportunity, you got to, now you're like desperate. i got to raise money. I'm running out of time. Fundraising may not go so well. you got to make tweets. Like, it, six months is really, really tough. And so I think you got to, you got to think in terms of, um, do I have the cash flow to sustain um, making myself successful? Which is also about keeping your burden down. Right. And, and you may be a very talented person, but there's a lot of chaos. So, in order for your talent to prove out, you need to stay in the game. And so you don't want, it's sort of like a, sometimes you sell sort of stock and you're on leverage and then the stock takes a little blip down, you're out of stock, right? Because you were on leverage. So you, you, need to, you need to have the ability to stay through a chaotic period and just make it through that period so that over time, the, the average of many good decisions and actions you're taking will build up. The other, the other comment I make on risk is, especially for you guys who are sort of looking at your next, your next job, I think it's very hard about who your manager is that you're going to go into work for. 
if you're going to go work for somebody who is excellent and you can learn a lot from and it's going to give you projects that you can kind of cut your teeth on, not too hard, not too easy, but sort of a strong level of talent for you, then you're going to get a lot out of the next two, three years. And that, that experience and the fact that you've grown a lot is going to make you someone people want to grab, whether you go to inside the same company or move to a different company. So you become you know, fungible, you become strong because you've had that great management experience with someone to learn from. So it doesn't really matter if you go to a big company or a little company. So like it doesn't really matter what law firm you hire for, a big law firm or a little law firm. Really, it's all the partners who work on your business. In this case, really all the person you're going to work for has a huge impact on your own personal career. The more you find a great person, then they need to have, you know, I feel safe and good about it. That's the fact, that's the company. Right? Like, the company's going to stagnate at your learn, but you just don't get the same level of challenge and promotion and opportunity. That's something that um, is really going fast. And then the last thought I, I have on this particular topic is, those who are really serious about starting something, but worried about if it doesn't go well, what happens to your reputation. If you manage yourself with integrity and you go after with passion, I will not. I would not worry about your employability. I think I still have not met a startup founder who fails who has trouble finding a job. But there's something about putting yourself out there that people just respect. I think if you have the reputation that you like really misbehaved in that period or didn't handle yourself well, didn't respect your investors. Yes, obviously. You know, any place, your, your integrity is the most important thing, right? You, you, you never want to get a job, right? But if, if people see you out there, you know, trying to work as hard as you can to make sure you're successful, it doesn't succeed. I can't speak outside of Boston, New York, California, the, 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 the entrepreneurial markets I know well. I, mean, I, I understand, like, historically, you know, in Western Europe, the see people come in, that's not what I'm talking about. But, you know, in, in our market, like markets that understand venture, um, I just still have not seen people struggle to find employment. You're not, you graduate from Harvard MBA, you spend three years trying to get a company off the ground in sales. You're not at all unemployable. You're not, like, well off career track and in big trouble. It's just, I, I've never seen that. I, I, don't see, I don't know if, if you have a fear. You just, you, just, you just wrote the tuition check to get the brand for your resume, right? So you got the brand. So don't worry. Go take a risk. It's fine. You know, you, it, and totally, it shows bravery, courageous, shows self confidence, independence. So it's definitely a positive character trait that someone puts a risk on themselves uh, by the startup. And, and just recognize it's chaotic. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. So don't don't be a jerk if you lose. Just just be gracious about it. Go on to the next thing and try again. It's self-reflective. I think that's the biggest thing in that interview when the startup didn't go well and you're interviewing for a job. They they want to hear your thoughtful process, like a really smart thought process. On what went wrong? Not you know it was all world world world's fault. And none of it was yours. Right. What else you going to say? Started companies in spaces we had no yeah. edge or domain experience in. That's true. I mean, I, I, like, so I think um, it's way better if you have edge, right? It's, it's way better if your uh, your background, you know, we just funded a company yesterday that announced it's in the art industry, uh, marketplace for the art industry, and we backed a guy who comes out of that industry and who's really deep and connected in that industry, and I think it's a great asset, right? Um, and then I, I also think if a lot of people are going after something and you're uniquely disadvantaged, that's really bad. I think what was neat about what we were doing was it was really hard technical problems, and there weren't a lot of people going after those problems. In fact, there weren't a lot of people who were really experts on those problems, right? Um, the other thing you can do that I highly recommend is go find the best person in the world to become your partner on it. You know, if you, if you really have something and you can inspire somebody who knows something about that space, 
you can immediately overnight solve the problem that you're not an expert there by bringing a partner in who is. So, yeah, absolutely. There's somewhere out here, there's someone saying, that great healthcare IT idea, and I just can't find any engineers who know how to build it, right? And you just, sometimes your search for business isn't like you sitting around coming up with this great idea. No business gets started without founders. And statistically, your odds of success go up as you add founders. Right? How many did you have for, for breakfast? Well, we had a that. We had five core founders. Oh, four. Four core founders. So four. We had five. So your odds of success go up. And, this is a side note, but your odds, I've read, your odds of success quadruple. Not like 5% better, but quadruple if one of the five people has experience selling. Right? Get a salesperson on your founding team because the salesperson will tell your engineers what you really need to build to get the truck, which turns out to be like important. So you you want that. So I would say don't think of your search as a search for a great healthcare idea. Think of your search as how do I find another human being with a similar set of interests with an orthogonal set of capabilities. So go find someone who's great at healthcare, IT, product management, or more. Come from that industry. They need your skill set and wake up, and then you'll break through. Um, so make it a search for a founder, a co founder, as opposed to a search for an idea. But it's great that you've got a direction. Like, I'm interested in healthcare IT, definitely a growing market, right? Definitely, we're going to be drowning in healthcare IT data. Every device in the world is going to be taking your weight and, you know, telling you your blood pressure. So, I think it's a great space to be in, a lot of activity. Go find a good partner. Yeah. Um, well, this, you know, the, the knee jerk answer is you should just do what it, if it's something else really great that you interest you, like five minutes, go do it. But, but the, I guess the rule of thumb would be you know, you can learn from the school of hard knocks, or you can learn from working with someone, you can learn from what's the, an apprentice model, work with someone who's just the best in the world at it. And I, we both learned a lot from the school of hard knocks, so it's hard not to endorse that, but let me tell you, it's, it's really painful. So I kind of wish along the way that he would really hurt me to go spend two years actually learning how to do it for real. So I would say, if you know that you really are grateful to product management, you enjoy that, go work for an organization that, that for which product management is, is strong, just do that for a couple of years and learn. doesn't mean you can't wrap up what you're doing in a, in a, in a graceful way, but boy, I, I think if you know already that that's a function you want to be strong at, it makes all sense in the world to go work the first couple of years at some place where you learn the right habit. So, so that's the advice that you get from, you know, ignore, you know, knowing full well that you're ignoring your device and just following your, your heart to where it goes. I would also say, don't be afraid to take more junior job at you know, lower salary. You're doing the stuff you want to do. Because that stuff, it takes care of itself on the way. You know, as opposed to, well, I stayed in this other functional area that's not as interesting to me because it will pay me more. I, I, I just, it's amazing to me the trade off. Like, I, I first saw it as an undergraduate where people took jobs they were less excited about for $10,000 more money. I still can't get over that. Like, I just, I, I just don't understand that mentality. Um, anyway, it's on a similar note. When you first graduated, you had a few months before you had a lot of money. And then, I'm not going to have a lot of money, but I didn't have that. But for instance, you did this well. You were in the first grade school. So that one, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say how, how little I did to get it or to be due diligence. I called a professor who was in the hospital and I'm like, hey, you know any startups? He's like, yeah, I know this one. And then they sent my name over and they're like, yeah, great, coming down. I literally 
I uh, called the guy. He's like, yeah, I'm free now. And I literally drove that afternoon in my blue jeans and, and just hang out with the guy for two hours. And then he's like, yeah, great, come on board. And then you have to really low salary. <laughs> but, but I didn't care. I wanted to, I wanted to experience. Um, so, and then embarrassingly, I did no due diligence. Didn't talk to any of the competitors. Didn't, didn't understand very much about the business. I mean, I was remarkably naive. I simply had gotten a referral from someone I knew, and that was it. Um, and in hindsight, I did very little due diligence on you as well. And so, I, I don't know, maybe that's how you end up doing these things, is, is not to worry too much about what can go wrong and just, just focus on getting out there and, and just getting the experience. I could see you was going to have a great experience running the product. That was what was important to me. But, but one of the lessons there also is networking, right? Like, yeah. you, you know, you may not have had a lot of credibility to be a product manager at that moment, right? But you were a smart guy and Bill Salmon, right? But yeah. really highly of you and said, let me make an introduction to somebody I respect. And it's something I'm investing in, right? Right. So I think, I think looking for ways to boost your credibility around people who know you using your network is just so, it's so key. So, absolutely. Yeah. So I think sales experience is really useful for uh, a lot of things in terms of experience. It's probably just true, like if you're killing it in sales, people are terrified to take you out of it, like because they're, they're making a lot of money. I mean, like if any of our sales guys came to me who were doing really well and said, hey, I want to do something else in the organization, I would have been like, oh, it's, you know, it just would have been, it would have been tough. So it's not something to that. I, I would comment that, like, I genuinely think, like, for MBAs, or even undergrads who are really in startup world might want to start a company someday. I actually favor product over sales because I think sales is a little bit more out on its own um, and not seeing sort of the engagement of everything in the company in the same way. And what they're seeing is critical, right? They're in the front lines with the customers. They're seeing what it takes to get the product sold, what the, what the uh, reservations are, the customers being like that. But more often than not, the feedback isn't, isn't done as well as it should. Like, that's not really where sales usually thrive. Um, products in the center of the mess. You know, they're talking to sales, they're talking to marketing, they're talking to engineering. They have none of the power, but they need to have all of the influence of the CEO. Um, they develop those influence skills to understand how the world organization works. So I'm a big believer in product first as, as sort of like the best place to be. Um, you know, and big dev is sort of a cousin of sales and has value and it's probably not as valuable as sales and definitely so in the stack could be like product sales, big dev for me. Um, but, uh, but that sales experience is like understanding the other position for what, what the sales organization does and sort of that orientation of leaning forward and being aggressive and, you know, getting things done um, that moves the dial for the customer. This is a such critical DNA. That, um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I see why people can get to a signal there, but I also see how much value that experience has. Probably it'd be great to, like, graduate from undergrad, do sales at a startup, go get an MBA, and then come out and do other stuff, right? But, like, um, so that you have that, but you have this break that gets you out of that, that signal. I don't know. I don't know. How do you think about it? Know thyself. If, you're, if, you're, if your DNA is going to be, like, world class sales guy, yeah, and go go do it, you know, and, and, and that can be your first job. But it's the kind of thing that you really, it's important to have a two year rotation and spend some, put, put the time in and see what's like to play your bag because then when you're the CEO, you, you'll, you'll get it. Until you realize that all you care about is a commission check and like put yourself in those shoes, all sorts of crazy behavior suddenly becomes clear to you that you would never have imagined someone would have done that, you know, unless. You kind of put yourself there. So I, I love it as a two-year rotation. I love it to have someone else on the team. But if you're a Harvard degree, you probably have some analytical skills that make product much better fit for you. But I know some some guys, I'm thinking of uh, Ajay, you know, he went out and did sales. Ajay, well, yeah. And he's stellar 
and he's an exceptional venture capitalist now, not really a, but he's, he's stellar at it. And, and so I think some people can fit the money you think it's good sales for good sales. Uh, 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 Who's money lost? Who's good at money lost? The, 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 the best paid guys probably both of our organizations and just about every organization in the sales Right? Because if they're killing it, Bruce is the company, it's direct one to one, they just do. It's amazing. Huge, huge emotional intelligence, want to live well. Those that that describes you, go for it. Go do that. Yeah. How do you think about your first round of funding? When is the right time? Is it going to be when you have your final hypothesis is cool and then this is the concept that you have to be developed and thought of really fast? Yeah, so um, I wonder if I've changed my answer now when I venture capital. <laughs> um, I hope I, I, So um, I think you need to get to a point of conviction where you really know this is the business you want to build. And the one thing I say is I think many people go and raise money too early. And it backs them into a corner and a whole bunch of ways. Right? I, I, the second you raise money, you are on a clock. It's an undeniable fact. And when that clock runs out, if you haven't raised more money, you're generally out of business. That's just not true before you raise money. Right? It's your time, your effort, it's you and your co-founders. Everyone's willing to do stuff for you for free because they might want to get involved at some point. But when you get on that clock, you're on the clock. Right? And what I see more often than I could is um, people who actually have done less diligence on their own opportunity than venture capitalists come and do on them. And I, that's crazy. Right? And it's like, here you are deciding you want to put the next five plus years of your life. For me, it's only one of X number of companies I'm going to be involved in as an investor, but you're going to put all your time in this. And by the way, if I then give you this money as an investor, you're stuck in this place. Right? So I think you want to find that. I mean, you don't want to wait until you're going to have to shut it down because, like, to do the next step, you absolutely need capital. You don't want to wait that far. I think you need to get to that conviction place, not where every box is checked and everything is known. That's not going to happen for a very long time. It doesn't ever happen. But, but to a place where you have conviction that you really, just really believe in this business and you've done your homework and you've made yourself an expert on this business. Expert is going to be 20 years experience. Expert, expertise can happen in 30 days. Right? It's very hard to do that. But it truly can happen in 30 days. Um, if you're sort of voracious for understanding um, the opportunity in space, right? Uh, I don't mean expertise the equivalent of the guys in their 20s, but you but you often find if you're doing something novel, there's nobody who's truly an expert at that, right? And so there are a lot of people who can inform you, who you can learn from, but you can pretty quickly make yourself an expert at that problem. Um, in 30 is aggressive, but 60, right? But I'm not saying you should be out for capital in six years. I'm saying whatever it takes to gain the expertise to be knowledgeable enough to um, really sort of have visceral beliefs and knowledge about the space, you got to get through that. It is a it, it's work. I mean, I, I feel like sometimes people get the idea that, like, Dropbox, like, you know, Drew thought of the idea, and, like, the next day it was worth $4 billion, right? It's a joke when we found it out that, you know, 12 years later, Ian was an overnight success. I mean, there are people who kind of, they, they, they check out of the story, and then the next thing they hear is it, it's worth a lot of money, and they think it was just so easy. Like, and it's not, it's really work, right? And I think the first part of that work, market selection, putting the team together, um, understanding your market, figuring out what products you build, that's formative key stuff, and you've you got to do it well, right? And I think when you're, and you feel like you've done it well, and you have it together, and you're knowledgeable, and you're ready to go, that's the time for it, man. Okay. Cool. Yeah. No, I, I very much admire everything Eric said. Most people go out and raise money too early. And nothing says amateur like showing up to a VC's office and using up their time with a half-baked idea that they've already seen five times from other people, and you make it all the classic mistakes because you're just too early to realize it. You mean all your competitors? Right. right. And then you look like an idiot. Oh, everyone's like you. I'll set them out. Right. So <laughs> most people go to it. So the last, what you're thinking is, my God, I have no salary. I need a VC so I can afford to work on it. That's just not the. That's not a successful way to think about it. The way to think about it is, I'm going to go out and prove that this is a real company. And the last guy I'm going to talk to is the VC. 
And in fact, almost all the time, the first money does not come from VC. It comes from your parents, your best friend, your spouse, or you know, your own pocketbook. But you, you basically, family and friends will give you money almost always for the first little crunch they throw your first ten thousand dollars, your first fifty thousand dollars. And if you, 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 you know, if you're not comfortable asking your own family for that kind of money, you don't even do waste the time with VC because you don't feel so certain and secure with it that um, you, if you don't have enough due diligence to feel good about taking your, your mother's money, then you're not ready to get talk to VC. So, and if people who know you who can actually afford to put money in don't want to give you money, like because remember that the people who know you, they're at a totally different level with you, right? There, there's actually already trust, there's belief in you. There were people who basically said to me, whatever you're doing, Eric, I would write a check on it. If you're putting your human capital in, I will write a check, right? Like, you need some of those people, right? Because those people, they don't know you, right? They're, there's so much less data for them than somebody who's been in class with you for two years and just thinks of you as one of the smartest people they've met. Right? So I, you definitely need some of those people. Sure. But how do you feel about how much money you should take from those people? You, you gotta, there's a couple things you got to do. I, I, one of the things I did was I said, if you give me this check, you know I will put my heart and soul into doing the best I can for it. But write it off right now. You got to be prepared that you're probably never going to see this much stuff. If that's not okay, that's going to be a problem for you. I, I'd ask you rather not have the money. So I mean, they're betting on you, and they're betting your human capital is worth more than their check. If they have trouble understanding that or appreciating that, you probably actually don't want their money. So uh, my father-in-law I did not take a check and still mad at me. He would have been fine. <laughs> sure. Okay. Anyway. Oh, I tried to eat. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to try to eat. Well, um, for me, I, I'll tell you, I got, so I went, I told the company, the first thing, and I got back and I met with my good mentor and said, geez, I, I was thinking of doing completely different. So, no, no, you need to find another company which has a material science from a media lab that can be sold to an electronics chain in which you are the middle component which you manufacture. I really think I could do more than that. You know, but people totally will. But, you know, because that's a travel, all about pattern recognition, right? So the last thing people want to do is take a bet on you in a new industry you've never been in. They want, so they immediately want to apply you. So only you, you know, it becomes progressively riskier as you get away from what you want. But in the end, when we launched the Earth, we followed our hearts and our up towards an opportunity that was, that was so exciting we were willing to bet our careers on it. That's, I think, the key thing. So I, I, I think you go to any industry if you really that passionate about it, but recognize the further you get from what you've done, the less credibility you have. Is that answer your question? So I, so I guess what I would add is I, I, I became incredibly passionate about this industry because I want to change it, but I never want to change the truth in this industry. It's a joke, you know, the, the 150 communicators in that room at a conference I mentioned, all of them were just for my college points on that. And then it's probably no usefulness for the rest of my life, right? And that's a lot, that's because a lot of people who are in that industry wish they could get to it. They've been in for years and they, and they can't get there, right? So it is sort of squandering um, an asset you feel. It, it is, undeniably. But I was desperate to open the funnel. You know, I had been a mile deep in something that really was never the place I expected to spend my career. Although, you know, we focused on dentistry. I mean, it was, there were a lot of other elements to this around that customization and then, 3D imaging and, um, and 3D display and all this other stuff. It's also really cool stuff. But um, I, I clearly didn't want to spend my whole career there. And, and I think one of the fun things about being a CCA is not a CCA center capitalist is now I get to look at tons of stuff, right? Um, from internet gaming to robotics to content marketing to it's all over the place, right? Uh, we have a textbook company that I'm really excited about. It's a textbook company I'm really excited about. So um, that's really, really fun. But it definitely um, 
So like, one of the things I love about the robotics company is it is a place to put in better device. And it is a place, I guess, to leverage or, or help with a lot of experience I've had and we've introduced a lot of talent. Because I have that talent for related to electronics and mechanical engineering and, and software around this thing. So, um, it is very nice to leverage what you know, but I've not done a single, I have over 100 investments, I've never I've done a single one in dentistry, and I probably won't. Uh, much of the disappointment is we see some same new deals in space. But um, I think it's actually like this classic thing. Most entrepreneurs who've been in this space never want to be in that space again. Like, yeah. they, they, um, you know, they know all the challenges, they know where all the bodies are buried, and they're like, oh man, if I knew, if I knew then, you know, what I know now, I never would have gone into it, I don't want to go back there. So, Sort of like my partner Chris Dixon, like never went to another consumer security company after side of five. So I didn't even want to invest in it. So I, you know, it's pretty squandering uh, some connection and stuff, but, but uh, I think it's pretty common. So yeah, I'm right behind you. I have a strong opinion on this in a bunch of ways. So, spent my entire first year still working on the business that I was in. Spent my entire second year working on this new business that I was starting. So, I think effectively we did this. Um, I think PCS is an unbelievable place to diligence and debt and do your work on an idea because everyone will talk to you and you're totally non threatening. People we felt we directly compete with would sit there telling us everything about how they did their business. Because we were a cute little students there. And it's just so adorable that we were interested and we were at Harvard Business School. Seriously, like they just, it was unthinkable to any of them that we could be a competitor when we were students. So I, I think it's a great platform from which to do that, make connections, do all that stuff. I think at the point that you know you want to start the business, and this is something where I'm going to get in trouble uh, effectively being on staff right now saying this, but I think when you know, yeah, that moment where you know you want to start the business, um, you really can't be at Harvard Business School. Right now, if you're 60 weeks from graduation, yeah, maybe. Right? But I just think when you're ready to go, you got to go. And I, I actually think it's irresponsible to raise capital while you're here. I think when you have capital, your job is to be all out trying to make success out of that capital. And you have limited resources, and the most limited resource of all is your time. And if you're sitting in a class, and you're reading cases, and you're doing projects unrelated to the business, and you're, you're using up somebody else's capital, I just think that's not the way it's supposed to work. So, it's just pretty forgiving about this. They open that door pretty wide for students. But I do think it's a great place to do it. Like, we made every second year project about Broncos. We, we did, Mike and I probably did eight projects on Broncos. They were all unrelated. They were like different aspects of the business. But we did, we just, I mean, we just used the time here incredibly well. But when you're ready to go, you really got to go. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a believer in that. I think it's, if you said tomorrow, look, I'm 100% and I totally believe in this idea. I want to raise money for it. I would say it's time to, it's time to leave school to go do that. I don't know. What's that now? Yeah. Okay, that's right. Is that it? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that today, but you know, what is the number? Uh, five years ago, you had a scary bad, but it helped you. Uh, I was in Rice, which is a place that's closed down, and I was like, you know, I just had to get out of it. It's surprising that you told me. You are, but you know what? You can network your way there. But I mean, I think you got to find people who respect you and trust you and think highly of you and think you're capable. You got to network your way. You, your startups are all about networking. I mean, the easiest job to get out of Harvard Business School is a consulting job. Right? I mean, it's so easy. I mean, it's literally like you get, they line they line up here to meet the students, right? And, and they have weeks dedicated to this, this, this process. And the hardest job to get, I don't know, maybe hard, a very hard to get, a job to get, a startup job because most of them don't come here, right? They, they, they're looking for a person, right? And I mean, it's been size, but they might be looking for a single person, right? And they can't come on campus for a group for a single person. So it's a lot harder to find. But because it's so inefficient, people get jobs exactly the way Russ did, right? Which is, I in the back of my head, I know I need somebody to take over product. I'm the CEO, I've been running product. I need somebody to jump in and take over that. We can just find somebody really smart who come in and do that. I can go get an experienced product person, but that's really expensive. I might like to have somebody that 
sort of, I can work with a little bit more and sort of groom. Um, oh, really? That's interesting. Bill Thomas sent me an email about this really smart guy at ACS who was interested in startups. They don't use that guy. Right? And we ended up hiring, we had an engineering background, but we hired a guy right at the FDA program to run products for us. So, and it was just because I happened to get introduced to him. I knew what I was going to serve. So, yeah, I, I, I like that. I think, why do people, why does a company hire a wet behind the ears Harvard student or Harvard MBA student? The answer is, they've got a really tough problem. They know they need someone smart to solve, and it's going to require a lot of work. So we're just going to let that, that kid do it. You know, like, it's, we need some smart person to solve this really tough problem. I, I don't think whether you, I, mean, I had a math degree, so is that a technical degree? I guess. I ended up going to a company with a chemistry company. I had I to take chemistry since 10th grade. Um, and I, so I started off just asking dumb questions. After five or six years, I have 25 patents now in, in this play. You know, okay. So what happened? I was just curious. And I just asked a bunch of questions. So I, I think the real question is, do you love technology and are you very interested in it? Because then, 30 days later, you'll be an expert because you'll be really fascinated. But if you just really care about surveillance, for example, and, and just the whole idea of, like, how does the molecule hook to another molecule? Like, if you can't think of any more tedious, you just want to know, like, how to finance the company and sell bonds, then, then you know, you should go to Wall Street, right? So go, don't take a product management job unless you're very fascinated by both the market and by the technology. And if you are fascinated by it, then I bet you're smart enough to pick it up pretty quick anyway. So I wouldn't worry about the lack of a formal degree as long as you have the, the heart. Let's say like you're setting your project, helping the company on products. Do you, uh, um, do you find ways you're going to start blogging about what you like about products and don't like about products, startup products, right? And that's space that's interesting to you. It's social networking or mobile services or, you know, because at the end of the day, that will all be part of how you tell a story that you actually have a point of view um, or some experience or thought process around that, right? I mean, uh, it, you do notice, like, how quickly people can start to basically put themselves in a position to get these people. So, yeah. Well, you can do a journey of professionals, so what's your answer? Um, so, so I think, like, there's some these processes that are a little bit lazy and they're perfect that are not totally useless, which are, for example, are they funded by a high quality venture capital fund? That does not mean it's going to be a successful company. But it probably means somebody smart did some diligence on this business, maybe knows the space a little bit better um, than you might or not, you know, the other the people, all that stuff. So I think that's like a useful but imperfect but not totally ridiculous process. I think you spend time with the people. You know, I actually really recommend, like, you know, it, it wasn't two offers from two different startup firms. It's definitely saying, hey, I want to make sure it's a really good set. Is there anyone else going to get at the company? Right? And just sort of, I'll try to help you right now. I'm going to just like take out the trash or set up lunch or I just want to get a feel for the company. If, you, if I can do some key meetings that are relevant to what you think I might want, you might want to be doing at some point, I'd love to do that. You know, hopefully, you know, be interviewed. It's good to be interviewed by a lot of people because you have to get a feel, ask them questions. Um, you know, look at their competitors, see if you think they're doing something interesting or unique. Ask them questions about sort of where they think their core differentiations are and see if you buy it. You know, is everyone drinking the Kool Aid that's very common in startups? Or is there really something there that you believe in? Um, but it's just almost like assessing that you're working with great people. I think that's like the, you really want to work with really good people. You know, and there's totally a range of quality because it's the wild west, right? And sort of getting convinced you're working with great people, I think, is the most important thing. Right. So, um, I so I think it's acceptable to take a salary significantly lower than what the consultants are making. And I also think it's acceptable that the salary is a very small amount of equity. Um, and because in the end, your first job, are you in business school? Your first job out of business school is not about getting rich. 
get this, you're about getting the experiences which will enable you to do something useful with your career. So your pay is all in your experience. So focus on future manager, what you're going to learn, and what your opportunity is going to be as a growth company. You know, responsibility you can take on, again, not too much, because that's a recipe for falling flat on your face, but not too little. So if you have the right job, I don't care what you're paying, as long as you can make your way. And I, I, I think actually it reflects poorly on a lot of Harvard MBAs. Everybody's nervous about Harvard MBAs, that they're going to be jerks for no reason. And so, like, you just confirm the stereotype when you're, when you give me all this stuff. So, maybe I'm a passion, but I don't, I don't think it's worth, I think you should negotiate one round to show you're not, like, a complete pushover, and, but then I just go, go with it. I wouldn't worry at all about the, the start. Now, after you've been there two or three years, you will understand what value you're bringing, and you'll decide whether you're going to re-up for another two or three years or just go find something else to do. At that moment, you can have a direct conversation with the management team and say, for me to make this my next thing for it, to, to sign up again, I need to see a salary here, and I need to see an equity participation here. But you don't know at this early stage what the equity is really worth, and the salary, you know, yeah, you should get as reasonable salary as you can, but I, I would just go for market. I wouldn't try to, try to you know, squeeze out an extra 10% to make a difference. So, I, I love that advice. I totally agree with it. The one only, only thing I'll add is, if you're going to negotiate for something, unless you absolutely need that salary, it's just all about the equity. I mean, just, there's nothing a CEO likes to hear more than, I believe in this company, I'm going to show myself for it. Honestly, the cash is fine. I know it's way below what my cash is for getting, but like, I just, like, I believe in the company I want as much equity as you're willing to do. So, if you do something there, that's what I care about. And I, my trick as a CEO was, um, my, my salary negotiation technique on the other side was, we didn't give out big grants to people um, unless they asked for them. We wanted people to value the equity. We wanted want them to look at it as, like, something that, like, they really didn't care about, but they got some care. With our, I, if somebody negotiated me a salary, they might get another 10%. If somebody negotiated me an equity, we didn't go as far as double. Right? So I don't know if everyone's like that, but like my thing is good to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I, I, unfortunately, not all my portfolio companies work that way. But I think it's so good. I really think um, CEOs, don't, founders, and CEOs, they don't mind when somebody really negotiates for equity. There's something about it. They don't actually give in on it. But there's something it's just totally different deal. So I don't know if you felt that way at all. Like I love the people who say yeah. that's what's important to me. Uh, yes, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly the because it's a baby, right? So the, the what, what's the best way to make friends with someone? Tell them their baby is beautiful. I believe right? it's just, I believe yeah. your baby. Your baby is beautiful. So like I, I like to have equity because I think I can create a lot of value as a as a, as a good parent. But then it gets too hard. But in the end, it's all meaningless. And you know, for us. I was always worried, and finally, at like year nine, it actually happened. I was always worried that someone in accounting would leave the payroll print out on a table somewhere, and everybody would see everybody's salaries and equity stake, and which is just terrible if it should happen. But I mean, once a decade, it happens, and you've got to be ready for that moment. Or, or so the other thing can happen is someone can be disgruntled in your accounting department and deliberately push it to everybody's servers. I mean, this, stuff like this happens. Or a post it on the web. So you got to be confident as a CEO that when you do your compensation structure, that there's internal equity, that it, you don't want it public, but if it were, you just look everybody in the eye the next day and it's going to work. And so for that reason, I try not to, to have too much wiggle room. And if I do, like double it, it would be if you can get this product launched by this date, then you will. But also, it's like you should just know your place. Like you can't have 100 employees and have 100 different deals. You need to have one set. So just recognize you can sort of work within limits and, and, and patterns. And so, you know, I mean, so I had it happen after the acquisition. Some people talked, and somebody came to me and said, "Look, I just don't understand why you got so much less equity than that person." And I said, "You made ten thousand dollars more a year." And they were like, "Wait, but I lost two hundred thousand dollars in fifty two years." And I was like, "That's what you. That was what was important. You didn't believe in. I mean, I, they did believe in the equity, but that was what was important to you. Right? You." You negotiated for salary. That was what they made a bet on the company, and they made a lot, and that worked out for them. It may not have worked out for them, but it worked out for them. I actually didn't have a problem justifying it. I, my view was I like people have to optimize for what's important to them, right? And I prefer people who bet on the company, but they have to optimize for what's important to them. So.
I would like to know for about one attempt uh, is here for uh, MRT. What is the uh, best chance for me for capture to get uh, this feedback uh, for my project? Because we can only get the updates when I go immediately for the uh, MRT. So can you make me a comment? Are you, are you, you're, you're not a student right now. I am a student and I was a great school for the MRT. Uh, and we get actually the movie for someone to get some uh, feedback on the project. I'll say one thing. Um, so first of all, I think the best feedback you can get is from people related to your industry or business. So uh, that's less like venture capitalists and stuff like that. So uh, to be honest, like, I think you, you've worked at something compelling and you put it in front of somebody and say, I'm working on this and let me talk to you. Most people are very willing to talk to you. Um, and you can network with people you want to get to. I think if you want to get in front of venture capitalists because you love their feedback, one thing that's been pretty amazing that I've noticed is like a lot of people now are doing open office hours. Um, and you can look for them, like literally ohours.org, I think it is. And um, with a lot of people doing open office hours, there's a lot of people doing open office hours. Um, over at the CIC in Cambridge, people are doing it. Um, I would go. I mean, you can always send in some kind of PowerPoint that holds, and you may get a response from different venture capitalists. But I just think, like, you can get in front of all these good people because they're willing to just sit down and, you know, sit down and talk to people. And, you know, there's, um, there aren't always VCs uh, there, but, like, there's an open coffee at um, Salted Cafe. There's, so I, I would take advantage of that stuff. So, um, actually, at the moment where we spent $100 million on ship anything, the CEO in place left. So, um, look, if you're found, this is another question that often comes up after you found the company, how do you stay on the management team? And two things can bite you. One is you fail, or it starts to fail, and the investors see you. And the other is it starts to succeed. And the investors say, aha, now we can get a really prudent person and make you hit again, right? So, you're, you've got uh, a half life. Of a couple of years, and then you get to turn character out, and then you might you might continue. And so, um, basically, whether you stay or not is is somewhat up to you in terms of how you whether you handle the situation gracefully. And I had a founder I talked to that I, I gave him that speech. He got a year into it. The company started to boom. The board came to him and said, "Listen, we'd like to put in a professional CEO over you." And move you down from CEO to like you know VP of product or something, and and because we had that discussion, he was grateful. I said, okay, fine, absolutely, I want respect for the person. They brought in someone from the outside world. A year later, it was clear that person really wasn't a good fit, and the board came back and said, you know what, you've, you've learned a lot. <laughs> We're going to put you back into the CEO role, and he was able to come back in because he had been grateful, you know, through that whole thing. So. That's what's under your control is how you behave in the middle of the chaotic. It's a very stressful environment, very chaotic environment. So people are, you know, really near the edge of their own of their own stress levels. And so you, you want to be have a strong stomach and be counted as a steady influence. The other thing is, sort of at the end of the day, what's most important for the company is to is to be successful. And if you're not the right person to lead it, they're gonna the board has a responsibility to switch you out and put someone else in who can. So, I mean, and you have to, you have to, the minute you take outside cash, you have to sign up for that notion that you now work in service of the corporation, that the corporation needs a better person, you need to step aside, not just for the value of your own shares, but because every other person around the table who's accepted options or bought stock does so with the understanding that you'll do what's best for the corporation. So I don't hold with the notion of like trying to somehow cling to a position if in fact 
things get too fast, or things break off, or someone else is better, you can be the first person to be willing to let that happen and just be mature about it. And good things will happen to you as a result because you have the right expectation of community. Um, so, the last comment I'll make there. What is the number one thing that you can do to avoid getting tossed out, having said all that? But the thing that constant people do is, particularly if you have a great concept and you type it up. Great, great, great. This is great. All these people want to invest. And so what do you do? You have a choice of five investors at a $10 million valuation. One thing you can do is pick the best of the five. The other thing you can do is say, okay, do I hear 15? Do I hear 20? You know who's going to give you 20 million valuation out of those five investors? The worst one, because he wasn't smart enough to walk away, right? So it's a winner's pick. So what I'm saying is, when you have multiple options, don't need that to try to drive the valuation way above the actual value. Try to get the valuation of the actual value, and then get the best quality investor that you can. Because what happens when you drive the valuation way ahead of your value is that the next round, everybody comes back to reality and they say, wait a second. Yes, you've added twice the number of customers, but you haven't actually gotten the value up to where it was before. So then they have a down round. What a down round means is shoot the CEO and restart everybody's option clock. And bad things happen with that round. So your job as a founder is, uh, you know, if you want to stay in the business and grow the business, try not to overhype the business because you look like a hero this round, but the next round, you look like a goat. Instead, just try to keep the valuation fair where it is so you're neither excessively high nor excessively low. And if you are so blessed that you have multiple choices, don't use it to jack the valuation. You need to pick the best person to bring up your team. So, so of course, the, I guess, last two years, the first one, the second one, the last one, we did have to raise more money. Yeah. No, we did. What, I guess, how do you, how were you able to still go through those investments and say, really, I feel like that? Yeah, it's all about, it's not a sympathy, it's all about just making a good business pitch, which is, hey, if you give me this money, I'll accomplish these things, and that will turn into so much profit for you. And because in the absence of, the, early in the company's life cycle, you can't point to actual revenue or profits. So what do you do? You have to make up some alternate way of showing whether they manage to make a product or not. Like, we want to move from 500,000 subscribers to a million subscribers in the next 12 months. You need to be very careful setting those metrics. Well, and the whole thing is, set the metrics to ones that you know you can achieve. I can't tell you how many management teams sort of feel like I've raised a lot of money, I need to set the bar really high, and I've only got a 50 50 shot at hitting the bar. That's ridiculous. Set the bar where you're going to have a 90 cent chance of hitting it, and then hit it most of the time so that people feel trust in you. And if setting the bar in a 90 cent chance of success means your valuation was too high or you know, you've mis- missold it, then you're in trouble and you need to correct it right away. And because as a manager, your job is to manage something in a way that everybody can rely that you will achieve your goals. So that means goals that are 90% of people will not. Maybe one more question. Yeah. Yeah. There are a lot of different approaches to this. So I, I think you want to be with great tips for people from before, but great people, and hopefully something that looks like it can scale really fast and that like you're excited about. I think I think there's a head of sort of a discussion size, but there's definitely an experience you get being a fifth person into a company that's different than the experience you get being a 500th person into a company. Um, so I think it depends a lot on what you're looking for. I mean, you can have a great career in startups. Person startups that are scaling really fast. You know, like HubSpot right now is this awesome machine and growing like crazy in Boston. Like, people get a great experience going to a company like that. But yes, you know, it's, 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 it's really different than going to, you know, Runkeeper, which is scaling really fast, but I think has 12, or um, the company on and down with learning, which is growing really fast, it, but it has five, right? And um, I think a little bit is kind of what you. I think if you, you say my next job is starting a company, like that's what I'm going to do next, there's definitely a virtue in being as early as possible into something in terms of seeing what that's like. But I wouldn't necessarily do that in a sub-optimized scenario with not extraordinary people um, where you could work for some amazing 
CEO, right? But a bigger organization. So it's, it's, there's no perfect, like it's hard to say what the perfect scenario is, but if the next thing you want to do is start a company, for enjoying the smallest thing you can, if it, if it has legs, it's probably a very worthwhile thing. Because you, you actually see what, how you get there from the beginning, right? As people have known since when they're, you know, it's like, you know, I was doing Facebook as a thousandth employee, and I saw incredible growth in my options, and I made a ton of money, and now I want to start a company. And it's like, that's pretty awesome. But you were at, you were at a big company. It's just really, it just is really different. Like, a big company with tons of distribution and this massive flywheel that was going, it's just really different than having been, you know, one of the first 20 people at that company. I like that. I would always put learning good habits as more important than what stage you have to enjoy. So, where is the place you're going to learn good habits? Either a small place with a great manager or a big place that knows what it's doing. Anyone else has one more burning question? Are we all set? All right, well, yeah. Um, really more. Um, what do you think about single foundry and how they can impact on something that's going to be Sorry, single founders and what? They have a little bit of traction in their company. Yeah, so as an investor, what I say is um, there are exceptions to every rule, but single founder and Russ gave us some data before, but single founder is the yellow flag. You know, it's, you wonder, as a single founder, you really wonder about whether they're going to be able to let the company just do it themselves. Like, why didn't they recruit somebody who's like extraordinary who's joining them and creating the company? That's such a chance to have it. You can never really give that to somebody later. It's such a huge asset to have that person. So, the question is if you're so good at getting talent, which is such a key to building a business, why are you starting a company with nobody else? There's no need to at that moment. You know what I mean? Like, if you have the kind of team going, for example, you build a website, you know, you can do and you can do it without too much traction. He's the act of all trades, master of none. I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a hard time, but I guess what I'm saying is to say that is to say that, like, I'm extraordinary at all these things. And I, it's getting traction power to you, but I, I guess what I've never seen is a business that's getting a good traction that doesn't have lots of core problems to solve, right? And um, the best way to solve this problem is to bring in people who are better than you at some things. And the danger is exactly what you're saying, which is, you kind of get this mindset that you're better than everybody at everything. So it'd be impossible to kind of find that person. I, like, I, I think that's the yellow flag right there. That doesn't mean we're right. It doesn't mean there aren't great examples of unbelievable businesses created by single I'm sure there are. But um, it, it is a yellow. I wouldn't call it a red flag. It's a yellow flag. Just think about what you're trying to build. You know, there are businesses, there's, there's a business, there are businesses out there which literally only have one employee. And if that's what you want to just try to tell a lifestyle business, if that's what you're trying to build, and you've got traction and you've got it, then that's great, you know. But we're really interested in building businesses that are going to have a big impact on society and, you know, employ large numbers of people. And, and so then, I would say, you're not a, a company with one founder. You're a company with room for five founders, of which one slot is being filled. Think about who you're going to afford to be and then what, what a more valuable company it would be. At that stage. But by the way, you're but only going to aim high. You know? yeah, so there's, 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 if you're trying to build a, you, know, you may not, you don't need venture money. If, it, if you're going to try to build a $5 million business that you own, which could be really lucrative, that could be more lucrative than owning being a, 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 you know, a founder of a, of a venture that started. One person owning a $5 million company can be great. So I'm not, I think that's perfectly fine. Just ask yourself what you're trying to build. Like you're trying to build a big company, co founders are critical. The only thing I say is great co founders are critical. Right? I mean, I, you know, there's this blog post on the dilution of co founders, how much they dilute your shop. Um, and you sort of reverse engineered the same exit, but if only you had hired employees instead of that co founder. And I think the fallacy of that is you'd probably never get to the same exit if you had a great, with or without a great co founder, right? Like that great co founder is part of the reason you got to that great exit. Um, but mediocre co-founders, I mean, it's certainly that blog applies really, really well to mediocre co-founders. Because mediocre co-founders are really expensive. They get a lot of equity up front, but they don't bring a lot of value. And so, you, you know, you've got to find great people. It's really critical. But it's the ultimate skill. Like, my test for whether somebody should stay, a founder should stay CEO of their company is can they, can they attract a great team around them? 
it is it's their greater attraction is extraordinary people, and those people respect them and want to be led by them. How can you ever take that person out of that job? Right? But if they're struggling, they're always getting fingers and so bad at B players and track C players, A players, track A players. Right? It, it, um, you know, it's really critical. You find it all the time. The B players definitely track C players. Right? And it's just the natural thing. They don't want people to challenge them. They want to be in charge. They want people who sort of, you know, just are agreeable to them and do whatever they say. Um, and really good people aren't like that. So, and don't assume founders have to split the company equally. That's not the case. You can change the percent, and it shouldn't, in my opinion, should not be the case. It's unrealistic to take everybody who brings into a body. Um, you know, you should, you should have a split based on the relative value, and then you can also play with vesting. So maybe somebody's already written a piece of code, and you're going to give them, but, but they're still going to stay it out. So they're going to get a smaller piece, but it's all vested. Somebody else is expected to make a huge impact, but hasn't done very much. Well, then they're going to have a bigger piece, but it's going to invest over four years. So you, you, you shouldn't be giving out your company necessarily, you know, you bring people in, make it for one year vest or something, and so that, so that there's, a, there's a chance to back out of it, and, and you'll give them a, a piece, but not a whole chunk. Um, so just be, be thoughtful and play with it. Definitely. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.